Okay, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Kaur, for the kind introduction. So we've come to our last lecture and I'll be delivering it. And the title is Contraception for Women Aged Over 40 Years. Okay. Okay, so what happens when a woman crosses the age of 40? So as we all know, fertility starts to decline by age 30 years and more rapidly so by mid-30s. And by age 45, the decline is so much that most women are unable to have a successful pregnancy. Nevertheless, effective contraception is required to prevent unplanned pregnancy. So why? Why is it risky? So there will be increase in the risk of congenital and chromosomal anomalies, spontaneous miscarriages, pregnancy complications, and hence leading to maternal morbidity and mortality. So it's been commonly said that life begins at 40, but many other things come in at 40 also. So the last thing we need is for a woman to embark on an unplanned pregnancy in this age group. Okay, so this is part of the Millennium Development Goals too, that is uh, NDG 5, which um, states there to improve maternal health. So this is to actually reduce the maternal mortality and to ensure that there is universal access to reproductive health. And this is, includes contraception too. So this is a graph showing causes of maternal mortality in Malaysia. So as you can see, the red line uh, stands for indirect causes of maternal mortality has been gradually increasing over the years. And mostly this is due to medical related problems. So contraceptive options are many. So I will elaborate each one briefly, okay? So before that, we'll start with the natural methods such as calendar, ovulation method, hormone monitoring, symptothermal. As for the barrier methods, the very famous condom for males and others are female condom, diaphragm, cervical cap and spermicides. As for the combined hormonal contraception, we have the oral combined contraception pills, extended period also known as seasonal, the patch, which is a combined hormonal contraception too, and finally the nuva ring. Then we have the progestogen only contraception, that is the POP or progestogen, progestogen only pill. As for the long acting reversible contraception, we have non hormonal ones and also hormonal. So the non hormonal ones are the copper IUD and also the frameless IUD. As for the hormonal LARC, we have the progestogen only injectables, that is the Depo Provera and the Net N, and also the intrauterine system, okay, commonly known as Mirena, and implant, just implant on. As for sterilization, for the female, we have BTL, and also hysteroscopic sterilization, and as for males, the vasectomy. Okay, so this is a table to show the failure rates of contraceptive methods. And as you can see, it is lowest in implanon, which is right in the middle. Okay, as for coitus interrupters and condoms, they are not as good. So now you have seen that there's so many kinds of contraception. So which is suitable? So remember, please, one size does not fit all, but the choice really matters. So no contraceptive method is contraindicated on the basis of age alone. So please, Carefully consider comorbidities, okay, before prescribing the most suitable one for these women. And these women should be given proper information about all the suitable methods for them to make an informed choice. So, as always, start with history and examination. Very, very important to ask about her personal and sexual history. Ask about history of smoking, partners, okay, sexual practices sexually transmitted disease and also history of vaginal discharge and then medical problems such as cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease history of neoplasia and also thrombosis as for the family history please ask okay about history of myocardial infarct and also venous thromboembolism check her bmi and most importantly please exclude pregnancy so we'll start with the combined hormone contraception. So this is a combination of estrogen and progestogen. The failure rate is 0.2 to 0.3 per 100 women years. So there are many examples in the market, such as Marvalon, Mercilon, Regulon, Regividon, it goes on and on. So these are pictures of the oral contraceptive pills, the ring, and also the patch. So the estrogen in here is ethanol estradiol, whereas the progestins may differ. 
So as you can see from the table, uh, the older progestins are the MPA, noradestrone, and also the LNG or nimonogestrel. The newer progestins, which are more anti-androgenic, are the disogestrel, cyclotron acetate, and finally we have last on the list, trosperinone. Okay, so how does it work? It inhibits ovulation, it causes alteration in the endometrium, thickens the cervical mucus, and may affect the tubal motility. It can be used if there are no coexisting diseases or risk factors, but use beyond age 50 is not recommended due to lack of safety evidence. So the absolute contraindications for combined hormon hormonal contraceptives are pregnancy, thromboembolism, cerebrovascular disease, liver diseases, ischemic heart disease, breast cancers, especially estrogen-dependent tumors, undiagnosed genital tract bleeding, and also recent trophoblastic disease. So there are also relative contraindications. So women who smoke less than 20 cigarettes per day or age more than 35 with no other risk factors. And these are people who have smoked, stopped smoking for more than one year. So the excess risk of myocardial infarct associated with smoking reduces significantly one year after stopping. And it's totally gone three to four years later, regardless of amount smoke. So the other relative contraindications are hypertension, diabetes, genetic hyperlipidemia, gallbladder disease, history of renal disease, and also impaired liver function. So what are the risks of combined hormonal contraceptives? So most importantly, the venous thromboembolism. The risk is highest in the first year of therapy, and it increases with increasing estrogen dosage, and also depends on the type of progestin. So the older progestins, Okay, such as the levonorgestrel and the norethindrone, they convey lower thrombotic risk as compared to the newer ones. But keeping this in mind, although the relative risk of venous thromboembolism increases up to fivefold, but in absolute terms, it is still. It is still very small. Sorry about that. It's going back. Okay. It's going, it's going back. Sorry. The slides are going backwards. This one? Next, next, next. next, next. Can you take this off? Ah, sure. Okay. Okay. All right. okay. Okay. Very sorry about that. Okay. Just look at this table. Huh? As you can see, okay, the VTE risk increases with age. Okay. So 20 to 24 years is 3.2 events per 100,000 women years. And when they reach 40, it goes up to 5.9 events per. 100,000 years, and it further rises exponentially after age 50. So pregnancy still tops it off. Okay, that is 60 cases per 100,000 women years, as compared to someone taking COCs, which is only 20 to 40 cases per 100,000 women years. As for the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, there's a very small increase in the absolute risk of myocardial infarct and ischemic stroke. And it's greater with higher doses of estrogen and increases further with smoking. As for hemorrhagic stroke, it does not show any increase. So, a monophasic pill with 30 micrograms or less ethanol estradiol with a low dose of norethistrone or levonorgestrel will be a suitable first-line option. So, as for cancers, it does not increase overall cancer risk or cancer mortality rate. As for breast cancer, the increase is very small. It's reduced to no excess risk 10 years after stopping, and the risk further increases with age and duration of usage. So if the lady has got a first-degree relative who's got breast cancer, it does not preclude the use of contra combined hormonal contraception. So as for cervical cancer, there's increased risk of cervical cancer and neoplasia after five years of use, and this increases with duration of usage, but reduces after stopping the hormonal contraception. So, but they have some benefits too, okay? It reduces hot flushes, menstrual bleed, and also pain. There's a reduction in risk of benign breast disease, and there's an increase in BMD. There's a 50% reduction in risk of ovarian and endometrial cancer, which continues further for 15 years after stopping. And there's also a reduction in the risk of colorectal cancers. Now, coming to progestogen-only contraception. There is no increase in risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke. However, 
if a lady is currently having VTE, venous thromboembolism, the risk of this progestogen only method outweighs the benefits. But women with previous VTE, the benefits still outweigh the risk. As for history of heart disease or stroke, risk of initiating a progestogen only injectable outweighs the benefits. Okay, however, if it's just a progestogen only pill or implants or even the LNG IUS, the benefits outweigh the risk. As for breast cancer, there's no significant increase in the risk of breast cancer. Now coming to bone mineral density, there is a reduction in bone mineral density with long-term use of progestogen again, uh, progestogen only injectable, but returns to normal after cessation. But we still don't know the relationship between the bone mineral densitometry and fracture risk in women more than 40 years on progestogen only injectable. It is still unclear up to today. So these are examples of progestogen only pills. And the ever famous Noride is there second. And finally, we have the Cerezet at the bottom. So as you can see, the progestogen in the Cerezet is desogestrel. So perhaps it will be more suitable in younger women. So again, pictures of Noride and Cerezet. So the benefits of progestogen-only pill do not cause increase in BP. The effect on the lipid profile and diabetes mellitus is minimal, and it can be given to smokers more than 35 years of age. It is safer for women with migraine and aura, heart disease, and also autoimmune diseases. The VTA risk is not increased. There's a small increase in CA breast, which reduces after stopping. So how does it work? Just like any progestogen, it thickens the cervical mucus, reduces the endometrial susceptibility to implantation, reduces the rate of ovulation, and suppress, in fact, it suppresses ovulation in 40% of women. As for Cerazet, it causes 97% ovulation inhibition with a good window period that is 12 hours huh, as compared to our Noride, which is only three hours. So coming to the progestogen only injectables, Depo Provera, okay, or Depo Medroxy Progesterone Acetate, 150 milligrams injected three monthly. The other is NetN or Norethistron Enantate, which is injected two monthly. So how does it work? Just like the progesterone I mentioned earlier, inhibiting ovulation, thickening the cervical mucus, and causes endometrial changes. So side effects, okay, progesterones may cause menstrual disturbances, weight gain, headache dizziness, mood changes, and also breast tenderness, and the risk of osteoporosis. So 5% bone is lost within first two years. Longer term use causes no further loss of bone, but it takes longer to recover after stopping. And it's still unknown if there will be full bone recovery. And the other not so good part about the injections is it cannot be removed if there are health concerns or side effects. So the risk outweigh benefits in women with multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So these are injectables. Huh? So the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health Care recommends to stop hormonal injectables okay, by 50 years of age. So coming to implants, okay, the implant on. Huh? So the progesterone here is etonogestrel. Huh? It's only one rod, which is inserted subdermally. It's so far the most effective reversible method of contraception, and it lasts for three years. There are no user failure rate. Additional protection is advised if it's not fitted within the first five days of menses. And it's safe in all women with comorbids, and it does not affect the EMD. There is no evidence to suggest an increased failure rate in women up to 149 kilos. And there's also no limit in number of times used. Just keep replacing it every three years. In 20% of women, there will be amenorrhea, which can be desirable for some, but it can mask other causes of irregular bleed where pathology needs to be excluded. So, Implanon contains 68 milligrams of etonogestrel. It is inserted subdermal. Again, just like any progesterone, it inhibits ovulation, thickens the cervical mucus, and causes endometrial changes. Okay, coming to IUCD. Okay, or intrauterine copper device. So now what we are using is the third generation, that is the copper 380A and multi-load 375. So in UK, the copper T380 is the first choice uh, and it's licensed for eight years, all right? Okay, so the surface area of copper determines its efficacy. So you need at least 300 
mm squared. It inhibits fertilization by direct toxicity. Copper is also toxic to ovarian sperm. Anti-implantation effect by inflammatory reaction within the endometrium takes place. And the copper in the cervical mucus also prevents sperm penetration. But it has its disadvantages too. Okay, it can cause intermenstrual bleeding, spotting, prolonged bleeding, especially for the first three to six months. So if it persists, you have to exclude sexually transmitted infections or gynae pathology. So, but keep in mind, STI is not increased with IUD, but fitting in the presence of STI can increase the PID risk within the first three weeks of use. As for asymptomatic women who are more than 40 years with an IUD, and if you think that she is at higher risk of uh, sexually transmitted infection, she should have an endocervical swab for chlamydia trachomatis as a minimum, and if needed, even for Neisseria gonorrhea. This depends on the prevalence in that particular area. But there's no indication to test for other lower genital tract organisms. So Mirena, okay, it's long-acting, rapidly reversible. It's a five-year contraceptive. It prevents implantation by endometrial changes. Okay, it also causes atrophy of the stroma and endometrial glands. So hence, it's also useful for patients with issues with menses. It also changes the cervical mucus. So it can be inserted up to seven days menses without backup contraception or any time with barrier contraceptives for seven days. Its side effects, irregular bleeding, amenorrhea, can be difficult to insert in nulliparous women. And there's an increased incidence of functional ovarian cysts compared to copper IUD. It also has progestogen side effects like breast tenderness and headache, but usually subsides by one month. Intrauterine systems should be removed after menopause because actinomyces-like organisms can be found in intrauterine devices and even intrauterine systems. But if there is no pain or fever or unscheduled bleeding, it can be left in situ as the overall risk of actinomyces related to PID is very, very low. So coming to barrier contraception, the male condom. So the failure rate is 2 to 15 per 100 women years. Reasons why does it fail? Because it is only put on after genital contact or not properly rolled on or even slips during sexual intercourse or it might just break. And using lubricant can actually weaken the latex. So not entirely safe huh? type of contraception. Coming to sterilization, so here for the female sterilization, we have either a mini laparotomy, laparoscopy or hysteroscopy. So this is permanent and mostly irreversible. It is 99% effective within one year after procedure. If the lady gets pregnant, there's a 33% chance, chance of being ectopic. Otherwise, it does not give any other benefits. And it is actually more difficult and higher risk than vasectomy. And there is no evidence so far that by doing a BTL that the women will require hysterectomy for other problems. So, you have to follow up these women, okay? So, they are advised to return when they have any problems with contraception or if they develop any new medical history and when they reach the age of 50. So, this is a table, a summary actually of all that I've mentioned before. As you can see, the POP or the progestogen only pill has got very few medical contraindications. Same thing with the progestogen only implant, okay, very few contraindications. So these are actually good choices, huh? especially in women with multiple comorbids. So yeah. when can a woman above 40 years be advised to stop contraception? So at age 55, that's the golden number. Why? Because as most, that is 95.9% will be menopausal by this age. So you have to measure the FSH on at least two occasions, one or two months apart, to predict the ovarian failure. So when do you stop someone who is on non-hormonal contraception? Okay, that is after one year of amenorrhea, but if she's less than 50 years, you have to wait for two years. Okay, the intrauterine device with more than 300 millimeters square of copper inserted at age more than 40 years can be retained until menopause, but she has to be followed up very closely. Okay, women on IUD when contraception is no longer required, okay, should be advised to return for removal. So when to stop a hormonal contraception? So women on combined hormonal contraception should be advised to switch to another suitable contraceptive method at age 50. 
Amenorrhea and FSH are not reliable indicators of ovarian failure, even if you measure during the hormone-free interval. So, how about the POP or implant? Okay, it can be continued until the age 55, or you can continue with the POP or implant and check the FSH levels on two occasions, one or two months apart. If both levels are more than 30 international units per liter, it's suggestive of menopause. So coming to the depot provera, the increase in FSH in a woman on depot suggests perimenopause. Why? Because depot can suppress FSH to some extent, meaning a woman can be menopausal and yet show no increase in FSH. So if the FSH is increased, then definitely she must be perimenopause. And the optimal time to measure FSH is just before a repeat the MPA is administered. Okay, removing the LNG IUS. So women with LNG IUS inserted at age 45 years or more for contraception or for the management of menorrhagia can be counseled about retaining the device up to seven years. Okay, again, this is a table, a summary of what that I've mentioned before. Okay, so for women on HRT, is contraception also required? So please remember, HRT is not contraceptive. Okay, as it inhibits ovulation in only 40% of women. The progestogen-only pill or IUD can be used with HRT for effective contraception. As for women who are on combined methods, they can use regimes of shorter pill-free intervals to reduce the risk of menopausal symptoms. So this is a thought for the day. Think about it. Okay, <coughs> birth control pills should really be made for men. What do you think? Okay, it makes more sense, doesn't it, to unload a gun than to shoot a bulletproof vest. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Dennis, thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions so far. From uh, First, from Amy Chan. Good evening, doctor. May I know how long can a lady be on injectable progesterone and implant on continuously? Okay, hi, Abby. Thank you for the question. So, as for injectable progesterone, uh, it is advocated till age 50 only. Okay, once the lady reaches 50, she has to switch to another kind of a contraception. And as for the implant on, she can continue using it until she attains menopause and we take 55 as the age of menopause. Or if you have levels of FSH that shows that she's already, already perimenopausal, then you can stop it straight away. Okay, Dennis. Uh, second question from Wang Chuan Yong. Good evening, doctor. During follow-up for IUCD, if we found that the IUCD is more than 2 cm from the fundus, does it mean that it is not in the proper position? If the IUCD is not in the proper position, what should we do? Thank you. Okay, ideally, it should be touching the fundus. Okay, if you don't think it is reaching the fundus, then you should reinsert the thing. Okay, third question from Putri Suraya. Hi, doctor. How to approach patients that refuse contraception, especially those with comorbidities despite counselling? Hi, Putri. Very good question. We face these problems quite frequently, isn't it? So we have to counsel them despite them refusing. But then if they still refuse, there's nothing much we can do, isn't it? So at least if a husband can, can agree to use a condom, that will be actually uh, something very, very good, isn't it? So maybe we should speak to both of them both husband and wife, so that the husband also understands her, her problems and why she needs contraception. Okay, last question today from Auni Zawawi. Good evening, doctor. What kind of contraception can we offer for 51 years old lady with underlying hypertension and ischemic heart disease? Okay, hi Auni. So if you had uh, listened to my slides earlier, so I think the best for this woman will probably be something like uh, Implanon. Okay, but um, because oh, she's already 51, isn't it? So anybody more than 50, we don't uh, actually advise combined hormonal contraceptives or even injectables. So a progestogen only uh, contraceptive will be best for her. And starting her on a, an implant on will be one of the good choices, okay, because it lasts for three years. And uh, maybe we can check after that if she's already attained menopause. And if she hasn't yet, then just continue for another three years and that's good enough. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tanis. Okay, I think